we serve an awesome God, and sometimes we just have to sing about it. I want you to sing with me. My God is awesome. Let's sing it out. My God is awesome. See, He can move mountains. He can move mountains. And He keeps me in the he valley. In the valley. And He hides Hide me from the me rain. From the rain. Sing, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me heals when I'm me broken. When I'm he is my strength when strength I've been weakened. Weak. Come on, say forever he will reign. Let's sing that again. My God. My God is awesome. He can he move mountains. Can move mountains. Keep, Keep me in the valley. In the valley. Somebody hide, hide me from the rain. My God. He heals, he heals me, me when I'm broken. Strength, Strength I've when I've been weakened. Forever He will reign. Let's sing. He's awesome. My God is awesome. 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 Let's sing that one word. Awesome. Savior of the whole world, He's the giver of, of salvation. salvation, by His stripes I am healed. My God is awesome, today, today I am forgiven, His grace, His grace is why I'm living, living. somebody praise His holy name. Welcome to the Glasgow Church of Christ uh, service here today. Thought, given the lockdown and not all being shut in our homes, it would be good to uh, to come out and just to uh, you know see some sights and break you out of your your cold, cold uh, or very very warm probably environment today on a on a nice Sunday morning. So it's just welcome to the service. I hope you uh, really enjoy worshiping God with us today. We're going to go through some more of our study of Deuteronomy in Deuteronomy 9 and more of remembering about God because he is uh, well worth remembering and well worth getting to know if you don't know him already. 
So uh, Adam will lead us in that and uh, we'll have a great service and afterwards we'll have communion on our Zoom call. Links are also on our website. So that's at Glasgow Church, just search for that. And if you haven't done already, um, please subscribe to our video feed here on uh, YouTube and, uh, and make any comments, like them, all helps with the algorithms and uh, helps us get noticed and helps God's word get out there. So let's uh, take it to God in prayer and then start the service. Lord Father God, we thank you so much just for um, the sights, the things that we have around us, your creation, which is absolutely wonderful. We thank you so much, God, that you, uh, you love us, that you care for us, and that you have the best of us in mind in everything that you do. We know that uh, we don't live up to your needs or your requirements, but you give us great grace in those moments, God. So we thank you so much for this, and it's for those reasons that we come and pray to you today and remember you and give you praise. So please look after everybody in these times, help everybody be comforted, help us to love one another truly, and uh, let's give this to you in prayer. Through your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes and fights for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is Defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. you today well uh, tomorrow night is burns night and if you're celebrating burns happy burns for tomorrow i'm going to be celebrating my family and having some haggis later on this evening and today we're going to carry on with our series of lessons going through the book of deuteronomy today's lesson is called not because of your righteousness before 2020 seems a long time ago now i used to travel a lot I would average about 20 flights a year. And I I enjoy the experience of flying. I love looking out the window and seeing life below, seeing the snow covered hills or mountains, or just looking at familiar cities from five or six miles high. I'm like a kid who's never flown before. And I love taking pictures 
and I, I love visiting places I haven't been to before or revisiting places that bring back happy memories of pleasant past experiences. Over the last year, we've all been on a different type of journey. We've had to all navigate COVID-19 and it's been a difficult journey for many of us. There have been many unknowns, lots of uncertainties. When will I see my family? Am I still going to have a job? Will I get sick? Will I and my family survive? Will I have enough toilet paper? This is really rough for all of us. I lost my job on the payday of March 2020. There was a conference call in my company and my boss told us at three o'clock in the afternoon that there wasn't enough money in the company to pay our salaries for that month that we had just worked. So for the first time in my life, I started to claim unemployment benefit. I was the breadwinner of the family of six and I found myself living and all my family living on government benefits. My wife was shielding for health reasons, so we're having government food parcels delivered. I remember talking to the woman in the job centre and just explaining my situation about how I'd lost my job and how my wife was on um, uh, was shielding and um, just see just everything that was going on in my life at that time. And I said to her, I said, um, I said, oh, you must have a lot of people phoning up like me in, in this situation. And I was looking for some validation that, you know, I'm just one of many. And she kind of went down the phone and just said, no, no, I, I've not actually spoken to anyone really like you in your situation. And it was it was a very interesting, very interesting time. And it was definitely a journey. It wasn't a planned journey. I felt lost. It felt like a wilderness. And I had to really rely on God. And today we're going to look at a people who have been on a journey themselves. A journey that they didn't all plan for themselves. They'd spent 40 years in, uh, in fact, wandering around the wilderness. The Israelites had come to the end of a journey, wandering around the desert, and were now about to start a new journey in the Promised Land. So please turn with me in your Bible, if you've got a Bible, to the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to pick it up in chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. After the Lord your God has gri driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take, uh, you're going to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord, your God, will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Understand then that this is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. God is finally going to lead the Israelites into the promised land. This is what they've been waiting for, for a long time. Their fathers have been waiting for this day. And their fathers too, all the way back to Abraham. In Genesis 15 verses 18 to 20, we see the promise made to Abraham. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenazites, Cadmorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergashites and Jebusites. You see, in Deuteronomy 9, is fulfillment of this promise. This is about 685 years earlier. 
This is how long they've been waiting for this day. But God had a message for them first. It was not because of their righteousness or because they were good people that God was doing this. It wasn't about what they had done. They had no reason to boast about how good they were. It was about the wickedness of the people currently living in Cana, the Anakites. What made them wicked? We don't know. What we know is that later on, the people surrounded the promised land would be people who made human sacrifices and would sacrifice their own children to appease false gods. Was it something similar for the Anakites? Explicitly, we, we don't know. But something was making them wicked. God also said that the Israelites were taking possession of the promised land because of the promise he made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God is a God who keeps his promises. So because of the promise to the patriarchs, because of the wickedness of the Anakites, God was going to give the land to the Israelites. Uh, they could have confidence as they went into the promised land. It wasn't about them. God had decided and all they had to do was obey and trust God. Abraham meant a lot to God and he meant a lot to the Israelites. Abraham believed God. God said to him, move. And he left his home in Haran and he left for the land of Canaan. This is God's calling for Abraham. In Genesis uh, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, uh, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. 19 years ago, I left England to move to Scotland for the gospel with my newlywed wife. God bless that. Other people did similar things. My friend William Smith also moved from England 19 years ago for the gospel. More recently, Rubik and Fiona and their daughter Lizzie moved to Glasgow for the gospel. And God will bless that decision too. Abraham was told he would become a father at the age of 100. This is God's promise to Abraham about his offspring. This is from Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. I am 47, and the thought of having a newborn baby at my age scares me. I can't imagine what it'd be like having a newborn baby at the age of 60 or 80, let alone 100. Helping a baby walk and crawl and potty train at the age of 100 years old. Back then, like now, it was all homeschooling at 100 years old. But Abraham believed God. He took God at his word. Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac, his son, the child of the promise. If I just look at the Old Testament in isolation, I actually find this very disturbing. Why would God do this? This just seems wrong. Yet Abraham obeyed. He answered God's call to sacrifice his only son. Not just obeyed, but he got up early the next morning to go and do it. Now with New Testament eyes, 
we understand Abraham was being called to, why Abraham was being called to sacrifice Isaac. We see Jesus, God's only son, being sacrificed. We see the parallel of how, how is often the case with the Old Testament. It's a foreshadow of the New Testament and it points to something greater. This is how the writer of Hebrews sees it. In Hebrews 11, 17 verse 19. By faith, Abraham, when, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham is given this incredible promise by God in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's, uh, and, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan and their wife there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the great tree of Moa at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is the promise that God tells the Israelites to trust in when they meet, when we meet them hundreds of years later at the side of the River Jordan, about to cross over into the promised land in Deuteronomy 9. All those years earlier, Abraham had been promised this land to his offspring and now his offspring were there these are the people spoken about all those years before what incredible time this must have been and abraham continued to remain a pillar to the jews right to the time of jesus this is what the apostle paul wrote to the church in galatia in the New Testament about God's promise to Abraham. This is Galatians chapter 4 and we're going to read verses 6 to 9 and then 13 to 14. So Abraham, uh, so, uh, so also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Paul says that those who live by faith are also children of Abraham and also share in a promise which is being held on to by the Israelites in Deuteronomy 9. He says that Christ's death on the cross took away our sin. That it redeems us so we might get the same blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham 
can be claimed by the Galatians. And by the same token, through that one time event of Jesus dying on the cross, we too can claim that promise. How incredible is that? Christ's death on the cross doesn't give us an inheritance in the physical Israel, maybe a few square feet in the Middle East. That's not what it's about. The cross of Christ enables us to enter the eternal kingdom, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is our destination of our journey. Not because of our righteousness, but because of Christ. In Romans 3, uh, verses 22-24, the Bible says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. I'm a sinner. I mess up. I've lied. I've spoken unkindly towards others. I've made bad assumptions and acted incorrectly based on those false assumptions. I've not spoken up when I should have spoken up. I've been deceitful. I've been rash and unwise. I'm selfish and I have fits of rage. It is not because of my righteousness that I take hold of the promise. In um, 1997, I started my own journey. I sat down with a friend and I studied the Bible and really saw what it said. I saw how true it was how accurate and trustworthy. It showed me my sin. I saw the damage my sin had done to myself and to others. How it had hurt people and how my sin had hurt God. The word of God and his spirit transformed me. If it was good for me and could take out my wickedness, then it could do the same for others. I turned my life around. So I orientated my life ab- about sharing the gospel with other people. If it can transform life, can transform my life, then it can transform the lives of others. And it did. I gave up my job. I gave up my career and took a 40% pay cut. And I worked for the church as a minister and I moved to Birmingham. While I was there, I fell in love with the woman I was working with. A woman who had similar values similar godly dreams and desires to help people. Amazingly, this woman, Kirsty, fell in love with me and we got married. She was a stunning and a beautiful bride. And a month after getting married, we were asked to come out the full-time ministry and asked to leave the church in Glasgow. God was taking us together on the journey. This time it's back to Kirsty's home country of Scotland. We had four beautiful children. But four years after the birth of our fourth child, our journey took a sharp and new direction. Kirsty was diagnosed with cancer. It was a monumental blow. Kirsty carried on with life and I carried on too. And then a year later, she was diagnosed with secondary cancer. There's no cure for secondary cancer. It's cancer that has reached stage four. It's often referred to as terminal cancer, although this wasn't a term we often used for it. Our journey once again took a dramatic turn. Nothing can prepare you for that diagnosis. While the rest of the world spins and carries on as normal, our world stopped. We more than ever had to stand and rely on the promises of God. I wanted to make up my own promises of God. I wanted to say, um, to see and, uh, and hear things in the Bible, to hear the Bible say my wife's cancer would be healed, that it would disappear, that she would live a long life. As much as I searched, I couldn't find that promise. I prayed and I fasted for healing, as did many others. But there was a promise we could stand on. And that promise was in the Bible, and it was in the Bible in a big way. 
And it's the promise which starts off with Abraham. It's the promise that we see as a theme scripture today in Deuteronomy 9, which the Israelites were standing on. It's the promise that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made possible. It's the promise of hope. It's the promise of salvation. It's the promise of new life with no more suffering and no more tears and no more sadness. On the 19th of November, 2020, my wife made one last leg of her journey. I watched as she breathed her last and she claimed the promise and she is now home. Her faith is now sight. Her hope is now fulfilled, not because of her righteousness, but because of the promise, because of Christ. My wife, her attitude was like that of Paul when he was in prison and chained and he wrote to the church in Philippi. And Philippians 3 verses 7 to 14 we read, But whatever were gains to me I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes uh, from the law, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on and take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forget what is behind and I straining forward what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing passage. And that really does sum up my wife's attitude. But there's more to this story. Along along the way, something amazing happened. We saw God work. We saw God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We saw ordinary people being transformed not because of their righteousness, but because of the same promise they too were standing on. These people helped us in our journey. They walked with us on our journey. They sacrificed, gave up their sleep, their time, their energy, their money to walk alongside us. And they continue to walk alongside me and my family. I do not walk alone but not because of my righteousness. The Bible gives this group of people a very special name. In the Bible, this group of people is called the Bride of Christ or the Church of Christ or simply the Church. You have been on a journey with COVID over the last year and that journey was set to continue for another few more months. The fact that you're watching this means you're also on a journey, a spiritual journey. And I really thank you for visiting us today. But please, if if you are visiting, please study the Bible. Please reach out to someone. Please request the Bible study in the chat. Please join us on Zoom in the fellowship after the final song. Find out what it really means to stand on the promises of God. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing on the promises, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. on the promise
sisters I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises standing. standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises Of God. I'm standing on the promises of God. 